The text for our message this morning is from Ruth chapter 1, and uh, we'll begin with verses 16 and 17. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. These are the words that I've actually often heard at weddings, rather than in terms of a mother-in-law and her daughter-in-law. Many couples see this level of commitment that is made from Ruth to her mother-in-law, Naomi, and they hear those verses and they want those as part of their wedding message. But truly, it is a words from a mother-in-law, or from a daughter-in-law to her mother-in-law. And one of the things that strikes me is we often do not study Ruth. Ruth doesn't show up very often in the pericopes. In fact, most of the time, we're in the prophets. We hear their instructions for us. We hear, the, we hear the Psalms every week as we study those at the beginning of the service. But how often do we get to Ruth? Very rarely, actually. And I really enjoy the story of Ruth. Although short as it may be, it shares with us God's provisions for us. It shares with us how he takes care of us no matter what we're going through. And if you are not completely familiar with the story of Ruth, as you heard, her, fa- her father-in-law died, and then her husband died. And Ruth was technically a free woman. She was a Moabite woman. She didn't have any responsibility to Naomi. But, out of love for her mother-in-law, she stayed with her. She honored that relationship, and even treated Naomi more as a mother than a mother-in-law. And she traveled back to Bethlehem with Naomi, where she had no property rights. In fact, when Naomi and Ruth returned to, the, to Bethlehem, they were so poor that she had to glean from the fields, which was what God had set up for the poor, the widows, and the orphans. But God looked upon her with favor. And the fields that she gleaned from were Boaz's fields. And Boaz became Ruth's kinsman redeemer. In case your Old Testament terminology is a bit rusty, a kinsman redeemer refers to a family member who takes care of another family member. More particularly, typically a kinsman redeemer is if a woman's husband dies, her brother-in-law or her husband's brother would marry her. And he would do this in order that the family would not leave the family, would not leave from them, in order that they would not be disinherited because the woman did not have the property rights. So the brother would marry and then he would be the kinsman redeemer, allowing for their firstborn child to continue with the name, to continue with the property. God further honored Ruth by also providing for her through Boaz, through marriage, and also included her as one of the four women who are in Christ's own genealogy. Now, as we consider Ruth and God's provision for Ruth, one of the things I'd like to focus on is also Ruth's honor towards her mother-in-law. It's rather a stunning example to me because it's so contrary to the example we see today set by our society. We see Ruth, and she truly embodies Christ's words in Exodus chapter 20. Honor thy father and thy mother. One of the Ten Commandments that we learned growing up. And we read that, and I think a lot of times we forget just how important it was. How important God made this commandment. Honor thy father and thy mother. Many children, instead of looking at their parents with honor, with love, with respect, instead look at their parents with, as obstacles. Obstacles towards adulthood. Obstacles towards being right. Perhaps many of you, it's been a while since you were children, but I'm sure if you think back, you can think of times in your life where you had that advice from your parents, and with a hollow response you said, okay, thanks. And then you went ahead and did whatever you were going to do anyway. Or perhaps the shoe is on the other foot. And you've given that good advice to your children or your grandchildren. And you've gotten the response, okay, thanks. How stunning is the example of Ruth in opposition to our current culture. How she honored Naomi despite the fact that she had no reason to. How she held her up and how he, she put her, put her as the priority. And I thought it's rather interesting as you think about that, especially as you consider where this commandment falls. Immediately following God's commands about how we are to honor him, 
God puts the command, honor your father and your mother. And Martin Luther, as he writes on this, also shows how high, how high esteem we should put our parents in. In his writings on the large, large catechism, he writes, For it is a higher thing to honor than to love one, referring to a parent. Inasmuch as it comprehends not only love, but also modesty, humility, and deference as to majesty. They're hidden and requires not only that they be addressed kindly and with reverence, but most of, most of all, that both in heart and with the body, we so act as to show that we esteem them very highly, and that next to God, we regard them as the very highest. As Martin Luther interpreted the fourth commandment there, as it is for us, or fifth commandment in the Reformed bodies, he saw the importance that God placed on that relationship between the parents and the children and the children and the parents. He saw the importance of that honor was not just about love, but it was also even in the times that we don't agree with our parents, even in the times where we don't respect our parents, we have a responsibility to honor them, to listen to their wishes. Now, this is often hard because of when we look at things in our society today, and we look back and we say, remember when? I'm sure most of you have used this phrase. I know I've used this phrase, remember when? And I say the one that comes to my mind is, remember when, sir or ma'am, was a regular way you addressed teachers in school. In fact, when I was in seventh grade, if you did not address your teachers by sir or ma'am, they would ignore you. I learned that quickly because I grew up on the East Coast for a few years where sir or ma'am had already passed, but there it was still required. And I'm sure most of you can think of ways that the society has changed, that we have changed in our response, to, and not just sir or ma'am, but in greater ways. And it's not just about dishonor. It's not just about distrust between between children and their parents, between parents and their children. It's, because, it's grown beyond that. In fact, you look at the news today. You hear all the time about people, parents who have born, given birth to children, who violently react to their children. Children who violently react to their parents. Even in our own community this week, we had the story of the breakdown of the family relationship and the murder-suicide that took place. Truly, Truly, th the family relationship has, is under attack by our world today. It's under attack by not just, not, just, not just outside, but even inside of our churches. No longer is the family put as the priority. In fact, our society has become much more of a me-centric society. We've become, fo become focused on ourselves. We want things now. We, want, we don't want to wait. The internet has taught us that by a click of a button, you can already have it before you even know it. Children are taught that they don't have to wait. That no doesn't really mean no, it's just a suggestion. And we've turned to putting ourselves first. Early on, scientists thought that the sun revolved around the earth. And we quickly discovered that that's not the case. However, our language still reflects a somewhat earth-centered attitude when we say the sun rises and the sun sets. And I think that also applies to the way some of us consider our lives. Very self-centered, me-centered. That things revolve around us if we don't get our way, if we don't have it in our time, if we don't do things the way we want them done, well, then it's not right. It's not okay. And this is a message that, as we've seen, has grown violent in families, has changed the way we look at families. Families have been torn apart as we've redefined marriage. Marriage at one time meant between a man and a woman and has changed now to mean whatever partner. Creation, we were each created uniquely and wonderfully as men and women. And our society has said, well, now it doesn't matter because we can change it by surgery. Children are able to get divorced from their parents now. Unbelievable. Unbelievable the way our society has destroyed families. 